Man in the Window contains depictions of sexual violence and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In the summer of 1976, Phyllis Sidga is 23 and living with her father in his small one-story yellow house in Rancho Cordova in the suburbs of Sacramento. Her father is a former small-town cop with a bit of dark humor. That is cop humor, too. That's... Well, it is. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I can remember my dad when we were little. If he had to watch me and my sister and my mom had to go to the grocery store, he worked down the, the jail and he put me and sister, my sister in a cell and we had both our toys. <laughs> you know, so we knew all the cops, you know. It's a rough humor, but one that serves Phyllis well in hard times. While her dad visits family in Boston, Phyllis stays home. She's comfortable on her own, even when she notices the green sedan parked across the street. It's been there before. She can tell there's a man inside the car, but can't quite catch his face. And every time you'd look over there, the head would turn the other way. And then it's if you did anything like walk towards it, the car would take off but it was always in the same spot. It wasn't the same day or it wasn't like continuous days. There'd be days in between. But, you know, after a while, you're kind of like, oh, there's that guy again. Phyllis is also getting odd phone calls. The phone rings, but when she picks up, there's no one there. She shrugs them off as just prank calls. On June 18th, 1976, she's sound asleep in bed one night when a soft noise wakes her. It sounded like someone's tapping on the wall. Tap, tap, tap. On the door frame. She thinks maybe it's her dad. That he was home early. And I go, you know, I, I may have said daddy or something like that. She's still groggy and can't make sense of what she's seeing. It's a man in the doorway. And then I see this person sitting there and I look down. There's no pants on. He's wearing just a T-shirt but his face is completely covered by a close-fitting white ski mask with openings only for the eyes. And I throw the blankets over my head, thinking, oh, maybe it's just a bad dream. I'll just turn over and go to sleep. But then he jumps on her. And it wasn't a bad dream. Did he speak for us? (laughs) Yeah. It definitely wasn't his normal voice. He was definitely playing around with it, you know, speaking low and and deep and gravelly. He's holding a knife, and he tells her, if you make one move or sound, I'll stick this knife in you. Man in the Window is pleased to have Simply Safe as its presenting sponsor. Simply Safe are the only ones doing home security right. Your other options? Traditional companies with outdated systems and expensive long term contracts, or new security gadget companies that you have to monitor yourself. What if you miss an alert? Who's going to call the police then? With Simply Safe, you leave the worrying to them. That's because Simply Safe has around the clock, 24 7 professional monitoring and police dispatch. They cover every door and window in your home, and they do it with small sensors and no wires. I didn't realize how important that would be to me until I got my Simply Safe system. But I love that the base station and entry sensors are so sleek, they blend in seamlessly with my home. With Simply Safe, there's no contract and there are no hidden fees. Best of all, 24 7 monitoring is just $14.99 a month. And they'll never lock you in a long term contract. Go to simplysafe.com slash window today, and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash window for the only home security I trust. simplysafe.com slash window. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, I'm Paige St. John, and this is Man in the Window. This is episode two, victim number one. The man in Phyllis's bedroom moves fast. He collects things to tie her up, her small robe, 
cloth belt, a bra and the electric cord from her hairdryer. He gags her with her slip and binds her so tight the circulation is cut off, and he presses a knife to her temple. I was not going to resist, you know, just get it done, get the hell out of my house, and leave me alone. It's basically what what my thoughts were. This will end, and you will be gone, and hopefully gone for good. But after he rapes Phyllis, he doesn't flee. Instead, he ransacks her room, digs through her laundry. She hears him move through the house, yanking open drawers, and he's whispering to himself, arguing with himself. She hears him hiss loudly, I told you to shut up. I was sitting there, you know, laying there, and I'm going, how long has it been? Well, you know, you lose all concept of time, and I decided, you know, I haven't heard anything, so I'm going to go ahead and try. So I very quietly tried to get my feet undone, but I couldn't get my hands. She slides off the bed. And I kind of tiptoe and kind of stick my head out the door and look down the hall and see nothing. Phyllis goes to her father's room, and with her hands tied behind her back, she lifts the phone off the nightstand. She lays down beside it and manages to dial zero from behind her back to call the operator. It seemed like that thing took forever to come back around to zero. She quickly moves her head to the receiver. But connected to the operator, and I said I needed to talk to the police. And he says, um, we don't handle Rancho Cordova, the sheriff's department does. And I said, oh, he says, you need to hang up and dial them. And I'm going, well, I'm a little tied up at the moment. The deputy drives Phyllis to the local hospital. By dawn, a doctor and a nurse conduct a rape check. They do swab tests and check for physical trauma. But the only injuries they note are a superficial cut above her right eye and rope burns on her wrist. Sacramento County doesn't have a sex crimes unit, and rape counseling barely exists. There's no one to meet Phyllis at the hospital, but the nurse who offers her a pill. And she goes, we can go ahead and give you something to calm you down and get you through this. And I told her, I says, no. After the brief hospital exam, a deputy drives her home. He kept looking in the rearview mirror. He goes, can you identify him? No, and he kept asking a lot of questions. It made me really, really uncomfortable. And I finally says, no. I says, I can't. I says, no. And he goes, are you really sure? Phyllis calls her father in Massachusetts. He's a stoic man, not given to emotion. But after he hangs up, he cries for three hours. And then he starts to drive. He'll drive three days straight to get to California. Phyllis's sister is also hundreds of miles away in San Diego. She calls a friend, Donna, and Donna takes Phyllis back to her home. And I spent the weekend in bed with the blankets over my head, you know, just just, just by myself, you know, just kind of like in denial. And then Donna says, was come in and say, you need to eat. Don't want to eat. You need to come out and eat with the family. I'm not going to eat with the family. Phyllis is deep in a hole until she remembers something her late mother once told her. I was probably 13. She's telling me that um, bad things are going to happen to me in my life, but that I was never to let them overwhelm me, that I would always find the inner strength and the perseverance to pull through and handle it. So I said... You need to put your big girl pants on and deal with it. Pull them up and get out there and um, show them what you got. The police photograph her bedroom and her backyard. An officer dusts for fingerprints and finds none. Police take Phyllis's bed sheets for evidence. By today's standards, Phyllis's rape investigation was shockingly cursory. The crime report by the officer at the scene is a scant eight pages, followed by a list of the evidence collected. The investigation stops at the fence between her house and her neighbors. There's no record that police actually questioned neighbors, nor do they seem to have looked into their own files. If they had, 
They would have found that Phyllis's house was broken into a few years before, but apparently nothing stolen. That residents had complained about a backyard prowler who busted open gates they tried to nail close. And they would have heard the story about the neighbor's dog. Four years earlier, in the house behind Phyllis lived the Waite family, and their dog Pups was so well known in the neighborhood, his deadly beating makes the front page of the local paper. Based on these reports, somebody was prowling at night and they're going through this one backyard, jumping on the fence to the Waits' house, and they killed the dog. A burglar repeatedly beat the dog with a hunk of wood, breaking his skull and ribs. His teeth were knocked out. His poodle had been beaten so bad they had to put it down. There's so much bizarre and gruesome activity around this tight cluster of tract houses that detectives will eventually consider this ground zero for the mayhem to come. Six days after Phyllis's rape, a sheriff's detective returns to her house with more questions. Does she know her rapist? Is she seeing someone? Does she know someone who fits the description of her attacker? Phyllis again says, she has no idea who her rapist may be. If so, the detective tells Phyllis, her case is being pended. Police speak for put on a shelf. He's closing the case even before the crime lab report is finished. The lab will find semen in the swabs taken during Phyllis's rape check. And even in this pre-DNA era, forensic investigators might still have been able to determine her attacker's blood type or identify unique enzymes that would narrow the suspect list. But with the case pended, there will be no further investigation. As he leaves her house, the sheriff's detective has a parting request for Phyllis. Call us if you learn who it is. Hiring is challenging. But there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash window. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates, so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. Right now, listeners of Man in the Window can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com window. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash W-I-N-D-O-W. ZipRecruiter.com slash window. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Summer is upon us, which means you get to wear shoes that are a little more fun and a little easier to toss on. Flats, heels, loafers. Ah, oh, the simplicity. The problem is... Wearing shoes without socks leads to sweaty, sticky, smelly, and blistered feet. You can try no-show socks, but let's be honest, those usually show. But Gex has solved all of these problems once and for all. Gex are the only no-show sock that actually stick inside your shoe. That way you can keep your no-sock style but stay comfortable and stench-free. The adjustment placement of Gex guarantees comfort and a true no-show look. The adjustable placement of Gex guarantees comfort and a true no-show look. And antimicrobial yarns destroy odor-causing bacteria before it can start. It's basically a sock that cleans itself. <laughs> How great is that? Take a few minutes to put them in and you'll happily forget about swamp foot all summer. Gex are available for men and women in many shoe styles, including flats, heels, sneakers, and loafers. Visit mygex.com, that's M-Y-G-E-K-K-S dot com, for 20% off your first order using the code WINDOW. That's mygex.com code WINDOW for 20% off your first order. (laughs) 
by the end of 1975, the Visalia Ransacker has broken into at least 125 homes. And then the crimes stop cold until Phyllis's rape, when the crimes escalate in frequency, gathering force like a powerful, violent storm. Inspector Richard Shelby believes he's found a pattern, a series of rapes so similar they must have been committed by the same man. There's the same opening line, the same raw whisper between clenched teeth, shut up, repeated again and again, the aimless opening and closing of doors, rummaging through cupboards. Almost all of the victims are raped and sodomized repeatedly. In the end, Shelby finds five rapes that fit this pattern, and it's taken him less than two weeks to piece it together. When he does, he brings his discovery to the head of the detective division. And I said, okay, we have a serial rapist. I was convinced by then that we did. Lieutenant Ray Root hears Shelby out without saying a word. And then he turns around, goes back to his desk, and starts pulling together an investigative team. But Root doesn't have the last say. That would be Sheriff Dwayne Lowe. Inspector Shelby isn't exactly on good terms with the sheriff and his aides. They didn't like what I knew, and I didn't like what I knew about them. So it's not surprising it doesn't go well when Lowe summons Shelby and the other investigators to his office to talk about the rapes Shelby's dug up. The sheriff is a strong-willed lawman with a bulldog face and a character to match. And he narrowly won a bitter campaign to get into office and looks to get re-elected. The last thing he needs is another serial rapist in Sacramento. The so-called early bird has been plaguing the county for three years with 42 victims. And Lowe wants to pin these new rapes on him. As the sheriff directs questions at the other detectives in the room, Shelby fumes. He knows more about these rapes than anybody, and the sheriff pointedly ignores him. As far as Shelby's concerned, the tactics of these two rapists are as different as night and day. This new predator carefully stalks his victims and orchestrates his attacks like someone who's done this for a long time time. Because of all the scoping the area, being in people's houses more than once, and little oddities he did, and taking jewelry in one house, leaving it in another, that kind of thing, being there and coming back. Early Bird did none of that. In Shelby's mind, the criminals have only two things in common. They are white, and they're men. A cop reporter is hanging around the detective division in Sacramento. He spots a memo on a desk, and the reporter sees the division is investigating a cluster of rapes on the east side. Shelby and Root ask the reporter to keep the information out of the paper for now so as not to tip off the rapist. So that kept it quiet for maybe a month. We don't know anything about this guy in public. If we tell them, they're going to start demanding all kinds of details. What does he look like? Hell, we don't know what he looks like. Got two legs and a man's all we can tell you. But the sheriff's department can't control the public. Rumors of the rapes in Rancho Cordova spread so widely, the president of a school parents club asked the sheriff to provide a public safety briefing. There's been no coverage of the rapes, yet nearly 300 people pack the school auditorium. And some are quite anxious. The morning papers carry the story the next day. Four days later, a headline writer at one of the papers gives the perpetrator a name the East Area Rapist. There's no more denying it. Sacramento County has a new serial rapist. The investigation is about to kick into gear. Lieutenant Root comes back to see Shelby. And he walked in and said, we're putting together a task force. Fourth floor isn't what you ought to. The fourth floor is where the top brass are, and they don't like Shelby. But Lieutenant Root is the one running the task force, and Root wants Shelby on his team. I did convince the captain, no, we need somebody to chase other theories. You know, you can't go investigate on one theory. You know, you need somebody to investigate those other. And I said, that's what Shelby does. He was just never officially assigned, so he was never counted on paper, you know. Not that Root could have stopped Shelby from chasing this case. Shelby did whatever he wanted to do. The East Area Rapist becomes Shelby's singular focus. He works overtime and then brings the case home with him. 
He hashes out the details over breakfast with his wife. It feels like the rapist has taken a seat at the table. At breakfast tables in other Sacramento homes, fears grow, fed by a steady stream of newspaper headlines. Rapist invades home number 22. Rapist hits 26 time. Women moving out because they're scared. Reporters accuse the sheriff of sitting on the information the public should know, and he's feeling the pressure, so he calls for a special briefing. The 40 local news agencies were invited to send a representative to this meeting because we, the sheriff was catching so much heat. Lieutenant Ray Root was at the meeting. We all were catching so much heat about no comment. Yeah, we can't talk about it. Nothing drives reporters crazier than, no, we can't tell you. Lowe agrees to share some information with the media, but there's a catch. We'll tell you everything we know. All you got to do is promise not to use it in your newspaper articles. The assembled journalists are instructed to hold back the details they're hearing for investigative reasons, to prevent copycats, and to protect details only the rapist would know. And almost every Northern California news outlet agrees. And so, the public doesn't learn about how the East Area Rapist stalks his victims for days and weeks and months. How he creeps into homes unseen to set up houses for a future attack. And how he empties bullets from guns, leaves doors and windows unlocked. Sheriff Lowe's decision not to tell the public about how the rapist operates means others are left vulnerable. Many will pay the price for police silence. Take one street in Rancho Cordova, where several such warnings were missed. Prank phone calls, a burglary. And then, in March 1977, a 15-year-old girl on this street looks out her front window. Well, she saw a guy walk across the street into the backyard of her neighbor's house. She knew the couple girls lived there. She closed the window, locked it, and pulled the blind, and went back to the TV. An hour later, one of the girls in the house across the street is brutally attacked by a man with a hatchet. And that woman was raped? Yep. That night. It was actually a teenage girl. She was raped. Shelby and the other detectives are adding new cases to their files. At the same time, they're searching back over old rape cases, looking for the rapist's origin. Back in 1976, they thought they'd found it. A trail leads to a one-story yellow house in Rancho Cordova, Phyllis Zitka's house. He says, well, Phyllis, you know, having a name starting with Z, you've always been at the end. I says, yes, yes, I understand. He goes, well, now you're first. And I'm going, excuse me? And he goes, well, now you're number one. He means victim number one. And there will be dozens of others. At first, the rapes are clustered tightly in Rancho Cordova and neighboring suburbs along the American River, one after another within blocks of each other. But when newspapers publish the exact location of the attacks, the rapist suddenly becomes unpredictable. Sheriff spokesman Bill Miller says the rapist's next move is anyone's guess. He's gone. And he was gone. Man, he went, oh, I mean, he was bouncing from one end of the county to the other. And now it's nearly impossible to set up stakeouts or decide where to beef up neighborhood patrols. There was no way to try to trace what, where he was going to go or what he was doing. Residents in Central California have no idea where he is. He could be far enough away not to worry or be right in their neighborhood. Television reports capture the public terror. I have to admit I'm scared to death. (laughs) Because he moved down here Saturday. Because he moved out here on the south side. We weren't too, you know, concerned when he was in the east area, but since he's moving closer and it seems like he's don't know where he's going to hit next. Sheriff Lowe had been concerned about the media tipping the rapist off to police surveillance. But Shelby says the rapist probably has a better source of information, the police. 
he couldn't help listening to the radio because that's all they talked about in the office and everywhere else. Inspector Shelby's convinced the attacker is listening in on police radio. And I said, he knows what we're doing. He could be with a monitor listening to his thoughts. In June 1977, Shelby and another officer are checking out a Prowler report in Carmichael, the suburb north of Rancho Cordova. There's no one home, but on the outside wall of the house, beneath the high window, they find a footprint. It's probably him. Let's just find out. At a house across the corner, there are more signs of prowling. He had been there. Excuse me, a young woman and a young mother and her daughter lived there. And they had times they'd come home, the door's unlocked, sometimes it's ajar. The big planter had been moved inside the house. They told me right there, it was him. So we told her what, she was being targeted. She was on his list. I'm sure he's gonna hit her any day. And so we told her how to handle it and all that. You know, the windows, etc. The detectives continue their sweep of the neighborhood. Across the street in the backyard of another house, they look beneath the foliage of a young tree. There's the footprints and the cigarette butts. So and there's no question we had this guy lined up. What next door to him man says, yeah, I saw a guy. And he watched him walk out the gate, out the backyard, through the gate, and turn down the street. Shelby talks to another man down the street who tells a tale so strange, it convinces him this is where the rapist will strike next. The man has a new job and keeps his work schedule on his nightstand. And in the drawer, he keeps his loaded gun. He came home and the work schedule was gone. The gun had been unloaded. Shelby and the other officer go back to the station and share their discovery with the task force. That generates a lot of excitement. Too much excitement. And too much talk. Some of the chatter ends up on the police radio. They've talked about it all over the place. So I remember telling Sid, this guy's not coming back to this street or this gal either, especially since we've been here. And so we didn't set up a stake out or anything, and he never showed up again. It's as if the East Area Rapist is listening in. Night after night, with each new rape, a police bulletin goes out over the radio. Described as a male white, with a black ski mask, dark blue or black one breaker, possible Adidas tennis shoes, numerous units in the area. Time and again, the trail is so fresh that Shelby's sure he's crossing paths with the rapist. But he almost has to be the guy that I saw walking down Dewey Boulevard one night. Everything stood up. It just, it just stood out. Check this guy out. Any other night, Shelby would turn around to check out the man caught in his headlights. But on this night, he's sure he knows who the rapist is. We had the search warrant. I was waiting for the word to go over and serve it, so I let him go. I still regret that. You go back over details, you think, if I turn right instead of the left, I could have had him. And it's always that close. By now, one year after Phyllis's assault, the rapist has hit 23 homes. And instead of just attacking women home alone, he's now pulling them out of the bedrooms and leaving their husbands tied up and their children asleep down the hall. The women are sexually assaulted three to five times, one woman eight times before he's through. And with each new victim, the East Area Rapist gets a headline, and each headline ratchets up the public fear. Gun sales skyrocket, and the deputy sheriff is ambivalent about how citizens use those guns. I'm just telling you that's an individual decision that has to be made. And frankly, I hope somebody blows his head off. Hardware stores run out of window locks and deadbolts, and there's a rush for guard dogs. A few weeks ago in Sacramento, it was hard to find homes for the larger dogs like this one. But now suddenly, all that has changed. We don't like just anybody coming in here and just adopting an animal from us as a watchdog. We are in the business here to supply people with pets. And residents police their own neighborhoods. A local dentist starts up a CB radio patrol. Suspicion and fear run so hot that neighbors worry about each other. And the tension makes community leaders worry about the prospect for violence. Every man, woman, and child in this city is looking for you. You had better give yourself up while you still have a chance because we are determined to apprehend you by whatever method it takes. Men with guns surround one worker arriving home from the graveyard shift, and they go after his neighbor with baseball bats. 
A third tells reporters he's threatened by members of the radio patrol. One said he's with the CB, and the other one said, just beat the hell out of him for the reward. Time and again, police and the media tell people all they need to do to be safe is to lock their doors. That's all. Just lock your door. In most of those East Area rape cases, the rapist has simply strolled right into the victim's house through an unlocked door or window, most of them unlocked even in the nighttime. All these precautions make people feel secure without actually keeping them safe. Locked doors and windows barely slow the rapist down. He just pries them open. And dogs bark all the time while the rapist prowls yards, and still their owners don't call police. And when the East Area Rapist does attack, sometimes the dogs are in the bedroom, lying there quietly as he rapes their owners. Police tell the public to be on the alert for suspicious behavior. Problem is, they're not told what that is or how to thwart the rapist. I imagine a lot of women in the area are scared and are nervous. Uh, if they could just kind of get to know each other's habits, their neighbor's habits, and call in if they see or hear anything suspicious at all. Uh, don't be afraid to get involved. You just call the police and say, hey, I heard or saw something in my neighbor's yard that looks suspicious. We'll get a unit there right away. The response time this morning after the victim called was three minutes. Phyllis Zitka is struggling with life after rape. It doesn't help that detectives drop by her office unannounced, asking embarrassing questions like, Was he circumcised? How in the hell would I know that? You know? No, I'm sorry. I didn't say, excuse me, can you turn the light on so I can take a look at you? You know? Phyllis is trying to move on without doing what the only other rape victim she knows did, move away. She remains at her father's house and tries to make her small room seem like someplace else. She moves the bed, gets new sheets, and paints the walls and ceiling a calming pale green and dyes the curtains to match. But going out in public is problematic. She feels people watching her, so Phyllis drops out of the bowling league until it draws a new crowd, people who don't know about the rape. There was quite a few that, you know, just looked at you like, you know, up and down, like instead of being up here on their level, now you're you're down here and you're damaged goods or whatever, you know, but it was your fault. It was your fault. And I finally decided I didn't do anything wrong and why should I be ashamed? And so that's the attitude I went with and that's the attitude I stayed with. And that helped a lot. By late 1977, Phyllis finally begins to feel normal, like she's putting the rape behind her. The East Terry Rapist has not struck in Rancho Cordova for months. And then the calls start again, like the ones before her rape. Often the phone rings. Phyllis picks it up and just hears dead silence. She pushes her fear aside by taking action. We had a recorder in the house because my dad always recorded conversations with his sisters. And they would do the same thing. So I says, okay, well, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to stick the little, the, take the machine out of the bedroom and put it on the kitchen phone. And that's the only phone we're going to answer because we're going to turn the recorder on before we pick up the phone and say hello. On January 2nd, 1978, the phone rings in the kitchen and Phyllis turns on the recorder and picks up. Hello? 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 And I start hearing heavy breathing, I'm going, okay. And I put the phone down. And because I didn't want to listen to that. She doesn't hang up, though, and the recorder is still rolling. And every now and then I pick up the phone again, and you know, <laughs> is it still on there? And then eventually I hung up, and then that's when I went ahead and called the detective and said, I just got a phone call. When police play back the recorded message, Phyllis hears it in its entirety for the first time. She
she recognizes the voice, and she feels a jolt of terror. They come over and they played the tape, and then I heard what he said, and that freaked me out. And I was like, oh, my God. He knows who I am. He knows where to find me. That whisper forced through clenched teeth. On the next episode of Man in the Window, the attacks become more vicious. Only about 200 yards from Phyllis's house, the rapist attacks a couple. There's a witness to the murders. I heard the third shot about halfway down the driveway and a scream and glass breaking. From the Los Angeles Times and Wondery, this is part two of six of Man in the Window. The individual charged with murder and kidnapping in this case, Joseph D'Angelo, has not yet been tried or entered a plea. He and his lawyers declined to comment. We'd like to express our gratitude to the women willing to tell their stories. A special thanks to the archive staff at the Center for Sacramento History. If you'd like to help us spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CastBox, and every major listening app, as well as Wondery.com. If you're listening on a smartphone, tap or swipe over the cover art of this podcast. You'll find the episode notes, including some details you may have missed. You'll also find some offers from our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help us bring you our shows for free. And thank you. Man in the Window was written and reported by me, Paige St. John. Senior producer and editor is Karen Lowe. Associate producer is Casey Georgie. And original music by Allison Layton Brown. Music coordinator is Marcelino Villalpando. Sound designed by Spoke Media. Our editors of the Los Angeles Times are Steve Clow and Shelby Grad. And licensing support from Erica Varela. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.